Uh, as usual, a few reminders before we get started here. And that is today is the last day to submit your contest entry. We just mentioned that poor old Mr. Frank Rohn was not able to submit his entry because of his power outage. But he's got it in now, so watch out. So if you have an entry, please get it in before 11.59 p.m. tonight. And of course, next Saturday is our membership meeting where we'll be gathering at the Jefferson Town Library at 1.30 and meet promptly start at 2 p.m. So please be on time, whether you're coming in person or joining in on Zoom, because we like to start on time. And then of course, a reminder that it's not too late to register for the Mid-Central Region Convention in oh, Pittsburgh. They're still getting everything together over there. They're, if you're planning on or thinking about attending, check out their website. They're adding and updating things all the time. So if you want the latest information, be proactive and go after it yourself. Don't wait for them to send it to you because you might miss out. And with that, Mr. Norman is going first and he will share his screen now. And let's see, there's the share. And he will introduce his topic, That's cars, right. building to evaluate. That's what we're talking about. Showed a little bit about the process that I use. There's nothing sacred to it, but uh, maybe pick up something. If you have a question, let me know. Otherwise, I'll keep rolling and assume that silence means that you understand it or you don't want to hear any more about it. But in any event, uh, you're not going to hurt my feelings by speaking up. So let's see if we can get going here. Get in the right thing. Page down. So what are we going to do here today? Explain what this, this clinic explains the process. We'll demonstrate, go through the process, and please and ask you to participate in an evaluation at some point in the future, anytime you'd like to. There's nothing secret to it. A guide, the achievement program mentors are listed on the division website. So if you have a question, they're listed on there, and we try to keep that up to date. And enable, we're here to help enable you to make it easier. So yeah, who would like to become a better modeler? Uh, Presumably most of us wouldn't be here Saturday. Uh, this clinic is interactive and urge you're encouraged. Of course, this is a virtual room. So message uh, Ron or just turn the microphone on and say something to me. And all of you have something to offer. I don't have all the answers by any stretch. Uh, we're always learning. This is, this is a snapshot of where we stood uh, at the end of February. Just see how, you know, up here at the top. This is all members uh, active and inactive. All members down here are just the MMRs to see who earned what um, in these different categories. And so in the structures, 85% of the MMRs have earned, you know, structures, 77% of them got, you know, the uh, locomotives and so on. Um, volunteer is obviously a huge, uh, huge area. We, we tend to help one another out uh, in that area, but just gives you a snapshot of, of how, uh, where, where we stand on things. So a typical learning path, you know, we most of us start out with simple kits, you know, shake a box type things. Then we migrate towards that from detailing and super detailing. And, that is, and those terms are defined in the, uh, on the AP webpage uh, at the NMRA. Uh, beyond that, craftsman kits, and some of us get around to kit batching We'll talk about these things a little bit and a little bit later. Scratch building cars and finally becoming a master builder of cars. And some simple kits. You learn the basics, you know, clean the car. You know, anything you get out of a box, you need to wash it and, and warm soapy water, rinse it thoroughly. And after I rinse it, I tend to rinse it with distilled water just to make sure we got everything out of it. So you got a, a raw surface. It's a good idea to wear latex or nitro gloves so you don't reintroduce your finger oils in there and mess everything up. Uh, what kind of paints you want to use? There's a lot of opinions. 
one thing I found is kind of convenient is stick with the same one or two brands so that you can kind of learn what works uh, for you. And you get to know it because each manufacturer has their own idiosyncrasies. Uh, decals, just you can get the ones there at the hobby shop or online. You can print decals without too much extra effort if you want something custom or you can order it out. How do you apply them? How do you make them where they're transparent that you just, they don't, they don't look like a decal. And then standards, and I'll touch on standards here coming up. So lesson one, develop and use a checklist. You know, however you want to do it. Uh, I keep one, I use, I just have mine. I happen to use uh, uh, Microsoft Notes, but it doesn't, ha uh, doesn't have to be that. So you can use a piece of paper, it doesn't matter. Use checklist, check it twice. And I find it convenient to keep a, a car record. You know, what paint did you use on that car? What couplers, you know, what is, how much does the car weigh? Anything you want to put on it, particularly if the car is damaged or something, you need to go back and say, wait a minute, that was a custom paint. Now, where, what did I use on that? Uh, records stay, work better than memory, at least for me, because my mind is, uh, well, it's slipping. So find it kind of handy to have a car record on each car. When detailing, super detailing, following the prototype practice, even if you're freelancing, you know, I'm looking at an Arctic car right now uh, that I'm working on. I cannot find the car number out there, but I found some of the, some from the same line. And you kind of use it as a inspiration and say, well, I'll just pick something with this similar car number and think I'm, I'm going to weather it similar to that particular car. At least it gives me something to look for. Why did that car get weathered the way it did? Um, Look for a, excuse me, I think I hit something. Okay, look for prototype in, images for inspiration. Uh, mil, mil, newly built cars are fine because you say, well, do I have to weather on my cars? No, you don't, but you won't get as high a, as high a score if you say, well, it's just straight out of the factory. You know, that it could be, but you're gonna get a little, a little bit fewer points. Weathered cars are far more common. I think all of us know that. If you just look, look through the windshield, you'll see it. And get advice from other modelers. I mean, really, I keep emphasizing, talk to one another and learn. I'm constantly learning. Evaluators or judges or modelers, too. Some, some people like the word judge, but the form says judging form. Evaluators, one of it. We're not trying to be judgmental, but we're trying to say, simply evaluate things. Uh, none of us knows everything, but... All of us know something. Uh, we just haven't have a car man in the uh, in the division that could tell you a whole lot. Uh, listen to feedback, good, bad, and ugly. Uh, someone critiques it. I mean, why did we? Why did you get as many as you do, or as few as you did? And, and hear what they have to say. Ask questions. Um, you know, we're all here to help. The whole AP program is an is an educational function, and we're here to help you. So. No one's perfect, so just ask a question and you know, grow, get better, especially use that checklist and remember things. Craftsman kids, they have a lot more stuff in the box, stirrups, grab bars, etc., are added, uh, not cast on. Um, and I'm kind of going backwards. Yesterday, I said there at the tracks, I saw a car come by, and the uncoupling lever was powder blue. I like, I hadn't seen that before, but for some reason, the last car in the line of these. Uh, car carriers was powder blue, so I thought that was interesting. But grow your skills, you know, learn, look at the prototype, try to mimic weathering using, using powders, um, watercolors, whatever, you know, you like. There's a number of great techniques out there. And dent cars, if you like. I, I use a, I take a soldering iron and turn the temperature down low and, and warp, bend the plant, you know, bend up the cars a little bit, particularly if it's a gondola or something that just gets them, that's get, uh, it's crap beating, beating out of it because that's where the real ones tend to look. Car records, we talked about it, paints, cup, cup, couplers, wheel sets, and whatever you want to put in there, you know, so um, 30 inch wheel, 33, what kind of wheel are you have on it? What manufacturer it makes it handy when things go, go, uh, go wrong downstream? Kit bashing, basically you simply say, uh, you're not working on a kit, but each kit is basically a source of parts. Um, it's your railroad, but it would make sense to, it, you know, do something that makes a whole lot of sense. 
you know, coupler heights, open loads, similar to the prototype, but you don't have to, if you want to, you know, have an open load or something, you know, fanciful, why not? It's, 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 it is, is after all a hobby, but we're kind of evaluating it. Uh, I think Mike Berry gave a presentation one time that they have standards as to how open loads have to be secured. And if you're mimicking that, that certainly makes it more look a little bit more realistic and probably get a few more points out of the deal. Prototypes have standards. This was one I just found one day several years ago, but it's, I started looking when I started building a scratch build a car and said, well, wait a second. They mu there must be some standards, you know, how wide, how long, and what are these definitions? Uh, I found one the other day, like where, where does this AEI tag, where does it belong? You know, and it says it's gotta be, you know, uh, a certain distance from the end of the car, but no more than this. It gives you a range that, that, that it can be in uh, both uh, from either end and, and height and location, depending on the top, top of the car. So it kind of gives you something to work from uh, if you're trying to mimic the, the real prototype world out there. Standards for your scale. This is again, I, I started out with that thing there and I took a look at a, at a freight car and simply said, well, in HO scale, it should be this width, the you know, width between the side sills. Here's the center line here, you know, from this bolster right here to the end, that's how, what the distance should be for the typical car. I'm, not, I'm sure you can find an exception to everything. Um, this right here, this this rod right in here, this where I put my bolsters, I just made a note of what I was doing uh, just to keep notes of it. I took a photograph with between the side sills and bolster sheet here. Just something to put together here. And so I could remember how to uh, repeat what I did. Uh, I used tube here for the bolster right there. That This is the part I used. And neither right nor wrong, but it gives me a guidance that I just wrote for myself so I can remember how to do it from uh, one to the next. Here's an underside of a car. Again, if you can find the prototype, uh, there's another one I have back here. It has entirely different rib structures. Like it looks like corrugated steel going all the way down here, a more modern vehicle. But this is one I took the prototype, looked at it and figure out what would I do at least to get the plastic pieces in place. Without, this does include the airlines and brake lines, that sort of thing. Why would you scratch build? Well, you can get something that you can't find on the market. Uh, some of you may have seen the uh, the flat cars with the covering the that the shuttle rocket boosters uh, rode on, and they have a a custom cover on it. It wasn't available commercially, and as fate would have it, once I built four of them, they came out commercially. But that's okay. It was a great learning experience, and uh, we have one of a kind in that regard. And I had enough, a uh, another little card used by the uh, by the Air Force, it's a one of a kind, or Defense Department, it's one of a kind. I've never found anything out there in the prototype, so I just scratch built it. And you can might decide to master on a material. Uh, late, uh, Joe Fields, uh, he was incredible what he could do with paper and cardstock and uh, CA. I mean, it just blew my mind what he could build. Uh, he taught me how to do it, but doesn't mean, no, not my area. But might find something you're good at and stick with it if you like, or branch out. What do you get out of it? Eh, the pro maybe a little bit of pride because you, you, you did it. And uh, and then you the feeling you have when the manufacturer releases the car a week later, like I said, you, you do it, but what the heck, you got you beat, beat them to the punch. Master builder cars, what's involved? Build four different types of operable cars for a total of eight. One must be a passenger car. And don't don't add anything into it. A passenger car can be a flat car with with seats if it's a um, something you know maybe something from a museum or whatever. Super detailed, more detailed the better. If you're trying to get the points, and you four of them must be scratch built and have a merit award of eighty seven and a half or higher. And we'll get into that. The judging guidelines are at the NMR website. There's the link to it. If you want to see what is looked at. It's not a secret. Just go to the NMRA, the AP pages, and look for the guidelines, and you can find them out there. Uh, and it explains what what is meant by uh, scratch build. What do, can you just? Uh, you don't have scratch builds or couplers. You can you get commercial, whatever you like. When it comes to documentation, 
the executive summary, not dissertation. Yes, it's fine to send us uh, provide us a 50 page dossier, but we're probably not going to read it, quite honestly. Come to the point, tell us the highlights of what it is, and then we can do it, dig back there for details. Uh, there's only so many hours in the day, and uh, the requirements are what they are. Don't add to them, don't subtract from them. They are what they are. And there's a tendency to overthink it, but if it says, Build eight cars, that's not seven, that's not nine, it's just build seven, eight of them, that's all there is. Address the requirements succinctly, let us know you did it so we're not having to guess. Um, we, you'll see in the matrix that's coming up, consider the amount and complexity of detail and the number of subordinate parts added. So if you look underneath the car, you got the, the airline down there, you got all the brake components up there. Uh, that's what you're looking at. We're looking for those sort of things. If you're a modern area, maybe AI tags. If you're, you know, back a few years, you're going to have barcodes and so on. A, you know, we're looking at the quantity of detail and to some extent the quality and then on your modern detail. Basically, the more you put on there, the make it look and feel like a car or anything else with a structure. Is there any cut lever detail? And they're appropriate safety devices. I mean, you've kind of common sense. Uh, the cut levers at the, on the locomotive are not the same as the ones on the cars. Um, do you have board by board construction? Describe, does it look real? Um, this one here, fascia boards, ease and troughs are more for our structure with some of the old wooden cars. These are thing, things, some of these things you'd be looking at. Um, you would, you may have some, if not doorknobs, door openers and things. Uh, took me a while to find it, like an end of those uh, cars, the uh, covers for the rocket motors. They actually have pedestrian doors on them and finding the right latch took me a little while. Then I just realized all I had to do was get the ones for uh, containers uh, that are used on containers or on uh, trucks and use, use those, uh, use those and just cut them down to size and it'll look, it'll look just fine. Um, and the you know, everything, accuracy, completeness, and placement, does it look like the prototype? They have standards as to where they, in the modern era, the reflective stripes, there is a standard to where those go and, and the spacing. So if you use the, if you kind of mimic a real car, you can get closer to the target. And here's the point matrix, like why did we get that number? So you see on the left-hand side here, complexity, simple to complex, you know. So how hard was it for you to do it and the quantity of it and, you know, and, and the, how detailed was the car from, you didn't do, did little or nothing all the way down to, is very difficult and you did a great job down here in this corner. So we use this as a guideline. And then around here, some of the other things we look at, uh, just some of the common pitfalls. Good joints, are they obvious? Or did you take time to, you know, carefully apply the, the uh, whatever you glue or solvent you used and maybe sand it if it did, if you, uh, things got a little bit out of control? Do we find fingerprints, you know, paint that looks like you used a four inch paintbrush? <laughs> decals, you did, oh, that were, there. it's obviously a decal, wasn't, uh, you didn't you solve a set or something to clear it out? Is anything, or things missing? Just flat, didn't put equipment we know should belong there. Brass phosphor wire is, is a little bit, uh, can be a bit of a challenge to hold paint, but if you take a little bit of a, a fine, super fine sandpaper and run the wire through it, it will, you can put a, a uh, coat of paint on it a couple times and it would it'll be hold, adhere a little bit better. Or things that you put on there just plain not uh, prototypical unless you're working in a fantasy world of some nature. If you tell, send the documentation in advance, that's really helpful. Uh, I said, you don't, you don't have to bring paperwork. You can just email a copy of the paperwork. That's perfectly acceptable. We can share it among the people that are judging, save a little bit of paper, and we can read it in advance. Uh, before you leave, tell your story. We can't read your, you know, I'm not a mind reader, maybe someone else is, but if you come in and say, well, this is the way, why, you did it the way you did it, then you're like, oh, I see what you're doing. I see why you did that now. Two or three of us will, about, members evaluate. Uh, at least two of us will have been 
done it a few times, several times actually, and maybe one person that's still coming up to um, coming up to speed because we're trying to do it. We give our initial scored reason. Now this is kind of interesting. So like it's very common to say Fred and Bob and I work together as a team and we, we don't converse about it. We look at, we talk about what we're observing, but we don't give our score until after we're all satisfied that we know what we're talking about and we give the number. We just verbalize it. I score the same, you know, 98. I would say generally speaking, we're within two or three points of one another. Occasionally one of us would be an outlier and we'll say, okay, um, Fred, how come you were 10 points higher or 10 points lower? You know, just, you know, and what was your reasoning? And, you know, we start talking about it, but generally you're pretty close to one another. Then we just say, okay, let's come to a consensus as to what the number should be looking at the matrix. And so we come up with the, the final number. We review the, the reasoning with the modeler and ask them ask questions uh, as well uh, as to this is where we had it. A recent one, we're doing a structure and said, beautiful model, it's sitting flat on the dirt. You didn't have a person didn't have a foundation or a basement wall, just doesn't look right. And things of that nature, that was a, obviously it was a stru structure. So, but take advantage, ask questions. Um, the challenge, learn something new and set a new goal. What's kind of master one, why don't you grow? But that's the uh, run through. Uh, mm -hmm. Any questions, comments, Rotten Tomatoes? If you have questions, Mark is the person to contact. And there we you appreciate go. all your AP work, Mark, your updates in the pie card. Yeah. And in general, all your work for the Division 8. Much appreciated. Well, thank, you. thank you. Enjoy. Well, let's surround myself with good people. Thanks, gentlemen. All right. And now it's time, without ado, for Mr. Fred. So what I'm going to talk about really falls on with what Mark just talked about. I'm going to talk about the eight quick examples that I did actually for my uh, Master Builder Car Certificate for the MMR. Uh, quick overview disclaimers here. Um, the whole reason for this was to meet the requirements for the Master Builder Cars. Uh, it was the last achievement program certificate for my MMR. Why was the last one? Uh, because I kept putting it off and putting it off and putting it off because I was intimidated. Um, I had never scratch built a model railroad car before I started working on these eight and they weren't all, they were not all eight scratch built, but I had never scratch built one. I'd never super detailed one. So I would put it off as long as I thought I could. And then I had this one to do and Indy Junction was coming up and Indy Junction was in May of 2022. And I wanted to help out with the modeling with the masters. Well, you can't help out with the modeling masters unless you are a master, master model railroader. And you can't be a master model railroader unless you do master builder cars or master builder locomotives. So I had myself in a quandary and it was October. Oh man. So I had October, November, December, January, February, March, April, May. I had eight months. No, I didn't have eight months because October was halfway gone. And I had to get it done before May because Indy Junction was early May. So I really only had six months. Well, actually I only had about four months if you start the middle of October to the middle of February because I had to get it done in time in February for Mark and one or more other people to take a look at what I had finished and then get it off to Frank Koch wearing his uh, region AP guy hat and then turn it over to the other side of his desk and Frank is now the NMRA achievement program guy and get it back to us in time for me to be an MMR before well you get the idea I had about four months to knock out eight cars four of which had to be scratch built and I had never scratch built a car in my life so it all got done um and I'll tell you what, all the work, all the work was done between October and February, except for this one bay window caboose that I had partially completed. It started out as an Atherin blue box uh, caboose, uh, bay window caboose that I had actually started building and had uh, painted it and, and lettered it, but I hadn't done any detailing on it. It had nothing. It was a basic blue box with paint and lettering, and it wasn't anywhere near ready to be evaluated for uh, the AP program. 
but everything else was was started from scratch in October or later. Those are the eight cars that I did. If uh, and, and most of you have seen these, if you've been coming to NMR, or excuse me, to Division Eight meetings over the last few years, you've seen all these. So I'm going to run through here real quick about how we got there. So here's a quick chart, and this is going to reinforce some of what Mark said. You have to do eight cars. If you look along the left side. There's eight cars listed. Those are the eight ones that I eight cars that I did. You have to have four different types of cars. I did two transfer cabooses and a regular caboose. Okay, that's one. I also did three box cars. That's the second type. I did a flat car. That's a third type. And finally, I did a passenger car. Now, if you look through the details on the requirements for the for the master builder cars. You'll see that you can do some cars that are kind of sort of the same as long as they are radically different. In other words, I could have probably done a wood sheathed uh, box car and a metal sided box car or a metal rib sided box car or something like that. And that would have counted as two. So I consider that the bay window caboose and the transfer caboose to be different. So I really did five, but it doesn't matter. I had four, no matter how you count this. Scratch bill, you got to do four. So I did the transfer cabooses and the two Chessy system, the b and c and box cars as scratch bill. Interesting, as you look down this list, uh, they're actually listed on here in the order in which I completed them. So yes, I did the scratch built cars before I did the kit built, super detailed, uh, customized cars. It makes no sense at all that I did that, but I did. You got to do one passenger car. There's my passenger car. I super detailed them all, and that's one of the requirements. They all have to be super detailed to one way or another. Um, all of these, except for the flat car, received a custom paint job by me. All these, except the flat car, received uh, decals that I created, and in many, in some cases that I purchased and then supplemented. Uh, they were all, all eight of them were weathered. All eight of them re received additional brake and uh, uh, airlines. They all received um, some other piece of detailing and so on and so forth. Passenger cars and cabooses all received passengers inside as well and on and on and on. So everything got super detailed. Uh, and then you don't have to get a merit award on all eight, but I submitted all eight for Merit Award just because um, because I wanted to, quite honestly, because I wanted to. And I said, why not? Let's see how they do. And they all did receive Merit Awards, some more than others. And as you would expect, the four scratch built scored higher than the four kit built. And that's exactly what I expected. And there you go. Okay, so let's move on. Again, there's the eight. Go talk about some stuff in here. Mark alluded to this before. Um, you're probably going to do some drawings. I had to do some drawings. The transfer cabooses were based on a Milwaukee Road transfer caboose. Uh, they, are, they were built way back in the 50s and 60s on a on a steam locomotive tender frames. Uh, there, there are still a few examples out and about in places you wouldn't imagine that they would be, but they are out there. So there are some, some good photos out there, but what got me interested, other than the fact that I love cabooses, is uh, there was an article several years ago in Model Railroader magazine where someone had scratch built one of those Milwaukee Road Transfer cabooses. I said, I can use that article as the basis for what I'm gonna do here and do a little more research. Interestingly enough, as I went through the article and compared that to drawings and to photographs, I found out that that article had some issues with it. And the issues it had was some of the documentation was flat out not correct. So I had to go back and revise what the Model Railroader article had, had basically advised me, which was not a big deal. The drawings you submit, the drawings you use, don't have to be CAD drawings. This is what I submitted for crying out loud, because this is what I use to move forward. Now, I'm gonna go back a slide here. If you look over on the left, you see the Pennsylvania Southern Transfer Caboose and the Milwaukee Road Transfer Caboose. Remarkably similar because guess what? It's the same basic construction. If you do it once and you take good notes, kind of like Mark was saying, 
you can do a second one. The two Chessy system boxcars up above, very, very similar. There are some distinct differences. If you know what you're looking for, you can see them. If you're a big Chessy system or VNO or CNO person, you can see what they are right off the top here. But if I don't point them out to you, you won't know. But again, by building one, taking good notes, I could knock out the second one. The transfer cabooses I built first. I would not recommend doing that. It was a huge project. It took me more than three weeks to finish the Milwaukee Road uh, transfer caboose. But you know what? The Pennsylvania Southern one I knocked out in about a week and a half. The same thing for the two boxcars. It took me almost three weeks to do the CNO. It took me about a week to do the BNO. Part of the reason was because I had all the parts, you know, all the bits and pieces on hand as well. Now, let me move on here. To build these things, it's just like building a kit, except, you know, they don't give you the parts. You got to get the parts yourselves and you got to mark out where you do stuff. So you get some styrene, you mark out where you're going to cut, you cut it, you start putting it together, just like you do with a kit. Everything you see in this photo, scratch built by Fred, except, of course, the lift rings. After you do that, oh, and by the way, you see all those pencil marks on the inside? Those pencil marks on the inside tell you, or told me, where all these bits and pieces are going to go for the inside of this transfer caboose. So there's the chairs, there's the tables, there's the toilet, there's the stove. You flip it over on the, you know, you build the, the basic structure, the, the chassis, if you will, and uh, you do all the piping and the rigging and so on and so forth. You do whatever you have to on the top side of it. Again, all, almost all this is scratch built. And then eventually you get to the point where you get to put things together, do some painting. And this was taken before I did some final touch-up work on the interior. If you look closely around the, uh, the chairs and the table there, you can see there's some glue that spilled out. Well, I just got a paintbrush out and I painted over that and you'd never know. And quite honestly, with the roof on this, you can't see it anyway, but I knew it was there, so I did paint that over. And yes, that little that little compartment on the bottom there, that is the toilet, and there is somebody sitting on the toilet. So why not, you know, make it fun. So that's what it looked like in, in a finished state. And as I said, it took just over three weeks to knock this thing out. Shouldn't have taken three weeks. Uh, and uh, I was very pleased with it. Another point here, um, one of the things that really got me more points and, and I feel good about is that every decal you see here, with the exception of the Milwaukee Road Herald, created on my home printer and, and pretty much using either Word or PowerPoint. Uh, and Bob Kugler actually gave me a, a couple sets of decals and said, some of these are in scale, some of these are HL, some of these, I don't know what they are. I'm sure you'll find something that will work. And in there, I did find a Milwaukee Road Herald uh, that worked quite nicely on the side of this thing. Uh, the biggest compliment I think I've received on this is Bob was, was the one who came over with Mark and said, uh, at the end of the evaluation, he said, you know, if I was modeling if I was modeling HO scale, I'd be offering you some money for that right now to run on my railroad. So there you go. This is the Pennsylvania Southern version. Now, if you know Bob Weinheimer, you know that, or if you know of him, you know that the Pennsylvania Southern is his home road. It is not a real one-to-one -one prototypical railroad. It never existed. It runs uh, in Pennsylvania down to West Virginia in, 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 on a uh, on a uh, on trackage that never existed, but was surveyed as a possibility by the Pennsylvania Railroad. They just never built it. So in Bob's world, it did happen, but it happened by this other railroad called the Pennsylvania Southern because it runs north to south. In fact, the, the, two, large rail, the two large staging areas on his railroad are North Yard and State Line Yard, and State Line is the state line between Pennsylvania and West Virginia. Um, but we operate at Bob's quite frequently, and I, I contacted him and said, you know, I'm working on this, and, you know, I think I'm going to build a couple transfer cabooses, and, and I usually work the yard, uh, the big yard, the Pittsburgh yard on the Pennsylvania Southern when we go there, and there's this little transfer job we do from the yard to Bridgeville and back. I mean, it's, it's nothing. You take a string of cars, 15, 20 cars, you take them out there, you drop them off, you pick up 15, 20 cars, you bring them back, and now the yard master in Pittsburgh has work to do to break down the train. We don't need a real caboose, but we always send a real caboose. I said, wouldn't it be neat if we had a transfer caboose? And his answer was, I've always wanted a transfer caboose. And I said, have I got a deal for you? So I built this. And what I did was I used the exact same drawings, the same process, same procedures, 
and made a better caboose than I did the first time using all the techniques of what I had learned the first time around on this thing. So, and the other thing I do is I coordinate with Bob and I already had a set of his, his uh, decals. No, take it back. I had a set of drawings for the decals. And then we figured out what number would work best into his numbering system for his cabooses. Metal cabooses are in the 900 series and he, he did not have anything above 990. So we decided it would be 991 at the top of the order. And as you look at this, all the decals again, except for the loop plate created on my home printer, including those diagonal white lines on the back as well. So again, that's the two on the left. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the two box cars. When I got ready to do the box cars. Um, I had a little bit, of, I had a little more time than I did for the uh, cabooses to get my act together. So I went, and, and again, many, many trips to scale, but uh, if Mike was here, he would tell you that uh, I probably spent two hours in there one day looking through what they had for styrene, making special orders and this, that, and the other. Uh, and Russ actually ordered some of the uh, Tishy um, uh, phosphorus bronze that you see down there in the bottom left corner and so forth. But this is all the materials that went into these two boxcars. But let's say it another way. Not everything you see here went into all the bo those two boxcars because obviously I had parts left over. But what was nice was I had everything on hand right there, ready to go, boom. I didn't have to go, oh, now I need to run back to the hobby shop or something. Oh, I need to order something. Because there were a couple of things that Scale didn't have and couldn't get for me. So I found it somewhere else. <clears throat> so same sort of thing. You get a plan, you start working on it. Fortunately, I had some really good drawings from the CNO and from Pullman Standard for these box cars. And I also had a 12 page document that Bob Weinheimer had used when he created this particular box car for his railroad. And it was the Chessie one, the CNO. He had taken a picture of it when he was in Louisville and it was outside the GE plant. Interestingly enough, I did some research after I built the first one before I built the second one and found out Bob had not gotten a couple of things straight. So the second one is actually more correct than the first one. It, unless I show you, you're not gonna know but I know, and that was what important. So uh, this first picture here is the ends and then building the bottom of this thing, very similar to what Mark did. And this is building the roof. You just cut parts out, man. And then you start gluing them together. These are the sides. And the underframe now is starting to come together with all that wonderful tissue wire. And there you go, you got a box car. It's like magic. Okay, it's not that fast, I realize that. But you know what, it's all, you get a plan, you come up with a template, you come up with a jig, whatever works for you, you cut the parts out, and then you just start assembling them. Much easier than what you might think. And there it is, fresh out of the paint shop without any decals or anything else on it, and the paint's still not trimmed up and so forth on it. And there it is sitting on the Pikeville uh, switching layout. Now, at this point, it has not been, uh, the paint has not quite been trimmed up a little bit. I've got to do a little bit of touch up here and there on the white. Uh, there's a couple decals that are still missing on it and there's no weathering. But eventually, that's what those two box cars ended up looking like. And I took the top one to the national convention last year in St. Louis. And that's the one that won the award for my WADA for most prototypical piece of rolling stock at the convention. Honestly, guys, that award means more to me than all the certificates I've earned for these things or any of the other cars at at all at at three different conventions that they've showed up at. That that meant much more to me. It's like, yeah, I I, I must have got something right when it did that. All right. Moving right along. <clears throat> Again, there's the eight of them. These I'm not going to go into as much detail. I know I wouldn't have as much time. I wanted to spend more on the first four because those were the scratch built ones. Okay, those are the scratch built ones. With these now, I want to talk just about how I modified kits. Now, quite honestly, this one is not your standard shake the box kind of kit. Um, it was a, a craftsman kit from the South Pacific Historical Technical Society. And the idea was, we'll give you enough parts to get you started. You got to finish it out with part, stuff you craft and create yourself. It came with a plastic deck. There was no way I was going to go forward with a plastic deck as part of my achievement program uh, 
for, for master builder car. That wasn't going to happen. So I ripped that off. And every one of those boards you see there is an individual plank that I put together, glued edge to edge. Uh, they were the, And initially they were stained separately uh, and then shake the box, put them back out there in a random order. And then we did some... <clears throat> some grungy additional stuff on some of those boards and so forth. And then it was glued down as a plate onto the top. The other thing you see on here is some weathering. There's a lot of weathering going on in there. And if I can zoom this in a little bit, sure, you can see that. Get it back there, there you go. If you look at that rust that's coming down, especially in that bottom right corner there, that's baking soda in a slurry of very thick acrylic paint. And when you kind of dab that on, let it dry completely, and then go over it with a thin wash of that same color of rust colored paint, that's what it looks like. It looks like some rust is really grunged up on there. So that was a technique I kind of played with. And you can see some of the other stuff that I did on here. Flip it over, I'm not gonna do it here, but, but if you flip it over and you look at the bottom, you can see all the additional piping that I added on there as well. So is it super detailed? Yeah, it is. It's just a flat car, but yeah, there's a lot of super detailing that actually went on to this thing. Um, let me move on here to the next slide. Oop, there we go. Too many. This car started out as one of the Branch Line Trains Blueprint series. Interestingly enough, um, <laughs> it started out as a Chessy System CNO box car, which makes no sense that I scratch built two of those things and then I removed the paint off the one that had it on it. But anyway, so this is for our home road, Santa Cruz and Felton. Obviously, based on a prototype, we're in 1981 down here in the basement. So, you know, in semi per diem, boxcars were a thing in the late 70s, early 80s. Just as Mark was, was saying, answering someone's question, absolutely. You've got enough prototypical stuff going on here. You can say this could have existed if the Santa Cruz of Felton was a real thing. So again, our own paint scheme, uh, every decal you see on this box car came out of my printer with the exception of the loop plates. Um, and yes, I can print loop plates. I just, I had some on hand, so why not use those? Uh, obviously it was a custom paint job and custom lettering. We printed it ourselves. Uh, if you know the branch line uh, blueprint series, you know that there's a lot of piping underneath for air and brake, but you can still add some more and we did. Uh, also on the other cars, we also added some uh, cut levers and so on and so forth on there. And some light weathering, not heavy. You know, it's not, it's 1981, it's not 1999. So this car has been in service since, as you see under here, it says November of 79. It's only a couple of years old. It's gonna have some rust, it's gonna have some grunge, but it's not gonna be a filthy, dirty, yucky, totally, you know, grunge bucket, sort of uh, rust bucket rolling down the rails, but it's going to have some use to it. So there you go. This one is an interesting one also. This is the passenger car. So this started out as one of those roundhouse, unlettered, undecorated, solid black uh, Overton Shorty 34-foot coaches. Yeah, there's a prototype form. And I use this. And I was like, oh, about this thing, but we'll see what happens. So what did I do to it? Um, well, first of all, I painted the silly thing white and then I painted it green because I wanted to have you know, a basic uh, primer on it to begin with. Otherwise that green would have just evaporated into the black, quite honestly. Um, ask me how I know and you know the answer is, I tried it and said, no, nah, we got to paint it white first. So again, all the decals on here from my printer. Uh, if you pop the top of the, uh, of the roof off and look inside, you'll see there's a floor in there. There's our seats that I uh, scratch built. I put passengers in there. And not only did I put passengers in there, I seated them so that they were having little conversations and so forth with different passengers inside of there. It wasn't just put 20 passengers in there and say, yep, I got them in there. I want to tell a little story about it as well. If you flip the car over, look at the bottom, you'll see that uh, there's a lot of additional piping and, and brake gear, air gear on there and so forth. Look at the ends, you can't see them too well, but uh, originally they had molded on handrails, scrape those off, use some of that wonderful tissue bronze wire, put those on there, uh, painted them a different color and so forth. Uh, the, the roof, uh, in the Clara story, there was nothing from Roundhouse. 
Uh, I used some cheap plastic, painted the inside of it the same color as the as the car itself, put that the inside, and away you go. Was there any weathering on it? Yes, but very light. There's a little bit of rust on the on the trucks. You can't see very well. There's some rust on the couplers, and there's a thin black wash across the side of the car. Remember, it's 1981. In this venue or in this mode, the car is operating as part of a tourist railroad. The cars are not going to be in really bad shape. They're not going to be grungy looking. They're going to be a little dirty here and there just from use, you know, and you don't wash them every day, but, you know, you do wash them occasionally. So that's why as you look between the boards, you can see that light wash of black on there. And that was it. All right, moving on. Last one here, I think. And this is that Athern Blue Box Caboose that I actually built from a Shake the Box kit, from a Blue Box kit back in about 1978 or 79, uh, using my Flow Quill uh, Burlington Northern Green and some Safety Orange uh, out of a Badger um, um, airbrush that probably cost me about $30 of that at that time. Uh, that was the initial paint on here. The Think Safety 102 in Safe Santa Cruz and Felton was done with individual letters from a dry transfer or rub on uh, uh, sheet of lettering. Oh my goodness. I can't even imagine somebody crazy enough to do that. And I'm the guy that did that. Um, but that's all it was. There was no glass. There were no end rails where they were those, you know, those yucky looking metal end rails that Atherin had on the blue books cabooses. Uh, so that was replaced. Uh, the decals on the door were new. The loop plate is new. The chimney is from a Walther's, uh, uh, bay window caboose. The interior was not scratch built, but I did add an interior to super detail it. And the interior is from that same, uh, 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 excuse me, Walther's uh, bay window caboose. I just popped it out of there. It didn't quite fit exactly. Had to do a little bit of trimming. It did fit in there. And then I uh, added some figures inside as well. And of course, flip it upside down and you'll see all the tea um phosphorus bronze wire under there as well so that's a super detailed kit it's not scratch built it's a blue box caboose that earned merit points it earned a merit award so for all the people out there that say oh you never get a merit award with a blue box kit yeah you can but you have to do some work to it you can't just slop it together and say done you got to do some things think about it custom paint job custom decals. Okay, they were dry transfers, but still uh, added the end rails, changed the roof around a bit, uh, added some underbody details, put a new interior in it, and then we gave it some weathering all over, and there you go. So there was the eight. As I said, you know, it's a quick look at eight different uh, pieces of rolling stock that I created, modified, whatever, for my AP certificate for Master Builder Cars. And that, my friends, wraps up everything I wanted to talk to you about this afternoon. Thanks, everybody, for coming up today. Any final comments before we sign off? No, thanks, uh, Mark and uh, Fred. And I hope you, I hope you all find your your eggs tomorrow. <laughs> that's a that's a great party, parting comment, Ross. Thank you. And with that, wishing your egg hunt well. We'll say goodbye. See you guys. Take care. Thanks for coming today. <laughs>